What a wonderful reception. Thank you so much. I would like to say, I've been taking dialect lessons in New York, and I would like to say, how you doing? <laughs> I understand that you had to answer a question with a question, right? So if I say, how are you doing, what do you say? <laughs> you say, who's asking, right? <laughs> so that's as far as I'm going to go. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Brian May. I'm very happy to be I have written a book in cooperation with two incredible people who have inspired me for the last six years. And I want to introduce them to you here right now. Ladies and gentlemen, this lady is late of the Smithsonian Institution. She's an amazing photo archivist. I have to say, nobody photo archives better than this lady. This is Paula Fleming. <laughs> and over here, a gentleman from a very foreign country called France. <laughs> And he is absolutely the best photo historian I've ever met in my life and ever will. You know, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Denis Pellerin. <laughs> He's not, he won't get too upset if you call him Dennis, but, you know, Denis, <laughs> is, he, he's got used to it, you know. So, um, we're going to channel something to you today. It's something which was born in the 1860s in France and has a lot of mystery to it, as you will see. Um, those of you who have the book already will have an idea, but we want to give you a kind of potted journey through this particular experience. It was founded in France in the 1860s. It's called Diablerie. Diablerie means more or less devilments. That's the closest we can get in English, probably. And um, what, with, what we're going to do is talk to you, but also show you um, some of the illustrations from the book. Now, I have to say, this is an approximation. We have red and green glasses here, red and cyan glasses, and it will give you a stereoscopic effect. The, the effect that you will get in the book with my patent owl stereoscope is way, way better. Particularly, um, it won't give you headaches, and particularly, you will get glorious color. You know, you, th this is kind of an approximation. You get some color here, but, you know, not the full experience. So before we go any further, um, take a look at your glasses, please. Make sure you get the red one on the left and try not to put your fingers on them because it really does mess you up. So that's the way round you have to do it. The, the red on the left and the green on the right, or the cyan on the right. And um, if you need to wear glasses to focus the screen where it is, bear in mind you need to keep your glasses on as well as these, these stereo glasses, okay? Now that's not stereo. That should look a bit stereo. Does that work for everybody? Okay. I'm going to dive straight in. Everybody knows what 3D is, right? Because we've all seen Avatar, right? So it's not necessary, which I love. You know, I think it's a wonderful um, exposition of the art and the science of uh, stereoscopy from James Cameron. Um, we're going to look at Victorian stereo, as I said. And um, yeah, just imagine if you stumbled across this box in, in a flea market, antique market, car boot sale or whatever, uh, you would be very lucky because th we only know of, a, of about half a dozen of these boxes in the entire world, and we've been collecting some of us for 40 years. So you would be very lucky to find this box. It's a box of stereo cards, and we'll be telling you more about what stereo cards are later. But basically, if you open this box, this is what you would see. Uh, first of all, you see a little list on the back, which intriguingly has 72 titles on it. And then you would take the, uh, the cards out of the box. Now, we've cheated slightly here because these have got yellow borders, but it's the same deal, really. Um, so there you would have a stereo card. It looks like two images the same, side by side. But of course, the two images have subtle differences because they've been taken from the two positions of our eyes. So there are parallax differences between these two images. Um, Something amazing happens to this particular kind of stereo card when you hold it up to the light. This is what it looks like with the light coming from behind your head. This is what it looks like with the light coming from the back. Now, th again, this is an approximation. You would see glorious color if this was real, if you had this in your hand. And you would see the eyes glow at you. And if there was any jewelry, you'd see it all glistening at you. It's an amazing experience to see this card held up to the light. Um, the magic is not yet complete, though, because if you put it in a stereo viewer, and this is a Victorian stereo viewer, um, and you hold it up and look through the stereo viewer, you get this kind of effect. Did I hear a wow? Wow. 
See, I, it never gets old for me. I just love <laughs> the business of seeing stereo, and it's, it's captured my imagination ever since I was a kid. Um, this is a particular card of great interest, but we'll return to this later. Um, again, you hold it up to the light, and the eyes will glow at you, if you're lucky, and the colors will come through. How do they do it? Well, if you turn the card over, this is what you'll see if it's fallen to bits. Um, it's a sandwich of, of uh, two pieces of cardboard which frame this particular kind of print, and it's a very thin print, so the light comes through. What they've done is put a sheet of tissue paper on the back of it, and you can see all these little pieces of gel that they've stuck on. That's to make the eyes glow. And if you peel back another layer, if you peel back this layer of tissue, you see that the colors have been painted on the back. So it's, it's an amazing piece of art and technology that makes the magic happen. And um, we have been making reproductions of the stereo cards um, for some time now. And I have to tell you, in the 21st century, it's almost impossible to do what they did in 1860. Um, just to show you, though, before we dive into the, the diaries, this is my patent stereoscope, which you will find in the book. It folds up in about three seconds into this focusing stereoscope, and you'll see that it has a card in it. That's our reproduction card as well. You don't get them with the book, but we're working on them. Um, the, the stereoscope was actually designed to make the illustrations in the book um, leap out in glorious stereo to you, and they will work, I promise you. So I'm going to hand you over now uh, to, to Paula, who's going to explain to you roughly what the context was around 1850 to 1860 at the time when the Diableries was born. What led to the Diableries? So Paula. Well, the late 1850s was a really creative time for photographers. They'd already been able to deal with the technical aspects and so what they could do is put all their attention towards coming up with really creative subjects. This rather macabre British view using real skeletons was an attempt at humor. It's called the Skeletons Carouse, uh, subtitled The Bone Vivance. <laughs> But, but in fact, the Victorians found that it was quite disturbing because there'd been a lot of grave robbing going on. <laughs> and you, some of you may also find it disturbing. Yeah. Other views were a little bit more successful. Um, this is Scrooge and Marley, based on the works of some up-and-coming writer by the name of Charles Dickens. Uh, Sir David Brewster, uh, he invented the kaleidoscope. You remember that toy you had when you were a kid? Well, he was also interested in stereo photography. And he realized if people moved while they were sitting for the daguerreotype portraits, it created a kind of ghost effect. Well, the photographers went wild with this. Uh, they did all sorts of things to create supernatural effects, and they basically did it by half exposing a negative. You'd, you'd expose a little bit, and then the person would, would leave. Now, this has all been, this was what was happening in Great Britain. Uh, over in France, they were mad for the devil and devilish things. And a photographer by the name of Lefort, I'm working on that, yeah. <laughs> Lefort, did Lefort. I say Lefort? You see, I'm getting my French Beautiful. lessons at the same time. Oh, thank you. Um, he depicted these really hellish scenes. Sometimes there are fire breathing dragons. Here we have a nice cauldron. Oop. Went too far? Okay. Huh? There you go. There's the cauldron. And all of this kind of set the stage for the creation of the Diableries in France. OK, we're going to call this Series A. Um, this is our own invention. There are actually seven different series of Diableries, but don't get too upset. You know, it, we're not going to show you all of them. We'd like to show you a selection. Series A, or the main series, as we like to call it, is by far the best. There's 72 of them. And um, if I just move this on, this is the first of them. Um, 
immediately they're extraordinary works of art. They were mostly created by two men, two wonderful sculptors, uh, both with names beginning with a silent H. They are called Enetier and Abert. Mr. Enetier was, as far as we can tell, pretty much a self-taught sculptor, and we know that he made bas-reliefs for the church. So this starts off as a very kind of biblical uh, exercise. Um, the other guy, uh, Monsieur Abert, uh, was very much a classically trained sculptor and studied uh, under Pradier, who was one of the foremost sculptors, particularly in the religious field of the time. So these two men, I see them kind of like Lennon and McCartney, if you remember who those guys were. You know, they, they come from slightly different places. They both have extraordinary talents, and together they forged a particular style, a whole genre of stereoscopic views. Um, we're going to linger silently on these for a little bit, you know, because sometimes you just need to have your own thoughts. But um, I'm going to hand you over to Denis now, who's going to take you through the first uh, images from the A series. Thank you. Well, the Albury's uh, tell lots of different stories, and one of the first stories they tell is the story of a Catholic country, France was a Catholic country, and uh, in which the, the fear of the devil was b very much alive, even in the, the mid-1850s. So uh, this is how the church uh, taught uh, Christians what uh, life after death could be if you had been a naughty boy on earth. <laughs> so you were, you were sentenced to, uh, to boil in a cauldron longer than a British Christmas pudding, actually. <laughs> <laughs> And so, of course, well, the, the vision of hell was uh, one of uh, devils with forks. And uh, as late as 1866, there was a novel called uh, Le Curé de Cucunion, the Cucunian priest, in which... Uh, sorry? You know that? Okay, good. And in which um, uh, um, Alphonse Daudet, the author, described exactly this scene. I mean, uh, the, 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 souls, the, da the souls of the damned being roasted, being boiled in hell. And this is exactly what happened. Of course, um, Enotier uh, put some humor in it. And one of the skeletons is actually biting, biting uh, <laughs> the, the arm of, uh, of his friends. <laughs> But it was, it was very, very, very close to what uh, people uh, actually believed in at the time, of course. Mm. In this religious view, Hennetier gives us, oh, thunderbolts and lightning. Very, very frightening. <laughs> However, he called it the Resurrection or Judgment Day. Um, it's a serious scene. Um, there's obviously lots going on here. But it, there's also a touching one. If you look to the lower left, Enetier has signed one of the tombstones. Thank you. And the couple just above that kissing, we think, could very well be him and his wife particularly since if you look at the small broken column to the left uh, would you point that to them yeah ah thank you that looks very much like a column that appeared on their uh, grave memorial Haber also depicted religious scenes and this is his last judgment and it's partially inspired by Michelangelo's uh, Sistine ceiling. You may remember Sharon, uh, he's the boatman, and he's shown on the right. So they had all sorts of classical inspirations for this, but it was still very much religious-based. Okay. We're still in religious territory here, although this isn't actually from the Bible. What's going on here? Well, this poor, unfortunate man, St. Anthony, is being tortured. He's being tempted through all his senses. And you can see his sense of smell is being tempted by a man who's putting a, um, an incense burner under his, under, under his nose. Uh, he's being tempted sexually because the lady is touching her bosom. He's being tempted by food. 
Um, all his senses. What are the other ones? I'm trying to think. Oh, the, the sound, yeah, the sound. He's being tempted by some horrible music being played to him, which I think is an accordion. I mean, what could be more horrible? <laughs> uh, no, we won't, we won't do accordion player jokes, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, even his pet pig is being tortured as well, which is really sad, I think. You know, they're torturing him, and I don't even want to tell you what they're doing to the pig. It's really <laughs> unfortunate. And this view has a sequel. This is called The Misery of St. Anthony, and things have gone further. He's being tortured even worse, and they've killed his pig. So it's very sad. Mm. This is as sad as it's going to get, folks. It's going to be <laughs> jolly from now on. But this is a very popular subject for all kinds of painters and photographers because it allows, it has a content which allows them to be sexy. And of course, you know, people everywhere want to, to do sexy things and it was forbidden under this regime. So this is a way of doing it. You do it religiously and you're allowed to be sexy, okay? Denny. S sorry. I uh, need to go backwards. Okay. So yes, well, we, we saw that Yabari started as religion-based religion uh, tableaus. Now we, we are now, um, here is another story, completely different story. This is the story of one man's hatred for another man. Now the scene here is set in, in Paris in car during Carnival, uh, in January and February. And you can see Satan, of course, pouring uh, champagne into a glass. And um, you can see, of course, some, of, uh, some skeletons coming to fetch uh, some of the revelers here and take them, of course, to hell. It's, um, uh, carnival was a very good time for Satan, of course, good, ha good harvest. Now, the, the, the interesting character is uh, the man here, the man with the battered hat and the patch. Well, for the French, this, this was Robert Macaire, who uh, used to be a character in a play. The play was not very good, but the actor who was uh, playing the main part one day decided to turn it into a comedy. Uh, of course, he, he, he managed to do it, he uh, did very well, and Robert Macaire became a type. Well, he became the archetype of the villain. He was a murderer, he was, uh, he was um, a, a confidence trickster, well, everything, a crook, whatever. He was the, the, the archetypal villain. Uh, and um, it's interesting because, of course, uh, lots of caricaturists and cartoonists uh, took up the character, and they, um, they gave him lots of adventures. But if you look at the pictures here, all of them are clean shaven. And the actor who created the part, Frédéric Lemaitre, was clean shaven too. Now, everybody recognized Robert Macaire, so why, gave, well, why did the, um, the sculptor give him a goatee beard and a mustache? Well, because the man who was publishing the Diableries at the time, his name was Lamiche, had a particular hatred for this man. And this man is Napoleon III. Now, at the time, well, he was first known as Louis Napoleon Bonaparte because he was Napoleon's the first nephew. And he was, and very few people know that even in France, he was the first elected president of the French Republic. And Lamiche was a Republican. All right? Uh, well, not in the, in the American sense of the word, of course, but he was a Republican, and in 1851, the president of France did something horrible in uh, Lamiche's eye. He um, took power by force, and one year later, he became Emperor Napoleon III. And Lamiche never forgave him for that, and for 20 years, he did everything he could to attack the regime. So, this man, Napoleon III, who, um, who was uh, taken here in 1858 on his 50th birthday, he was at the top of his power, he had an heir, he, was, uh, he had just uh, survived uh, an attempt on his life, so he was very popular and powerful, and this man, of course, is the one depicted here. So from, from this picture onwards, the diableries will become attacks on the regime, and sometimes, of course, the devil himself will be Napoleon III. And if you look at the pictures, you will see that very often the devil has a moustache and a goatee beard. <laughs> so here is the picture, the whole picture again. Now here is another one. <coughs> Les Femmes de Satan au bain, Satan's Women's Bathing. Now it looks like just another diablerie. Um, naked women bathing and uh, skeletons trying to uh, ogle them and uh, Satan 
with a whip. Now if you look a bit closer, well this is the colored version, you'll find some very interesting information. Well, this was the information. I'm sure you were all looking at the background of the picture, right? <laughs> no, you were not. Okay, so let's go back to the picture. So the, 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 the rock you see in the background is an actual rock. It is in Biarritz in France. And Biarritz was one of the imperial residences. Uh, this is where the emperor and his wife would spend a month, usually every year in September, from 1856 to the end of the regime. <laughs> and uh, the lighthouse is also uh, the lighthouse of Biarritz. So you must remember that at the time there was censorship in France. You couldn't uh, f produce anything, a book or an engraving or a photograph, without submitting uh, the, the, um, the, your work to the censors. And you had to be very careful because you could go to prison. And Lamiche managed, Lamiche and uh, the two sculptors managed to allude to um, the regime, to attack the regime very subtly, and they actually got through. This is uh, uh, the, last, uh, the last of this um, political slide. It's called the Review of the Infernal Guard. Now, Lamiche, just one month after this, uh, this photo was copyrighted, um, is... is um, studio was raided by the police and they found a photo, an actual photo of the real emperor reviewing his real imperial guard and the photo was captioned review of the infernal guard. Now the police did not arrest Lamish at the time but he was sent to prison one month later because he was also dealing in naughty pictures and that of course was <laughs> unforgivable. <laughs> And I don't know why they gave this one to me. <laughs> this is, no idea. This is a musical picture, obviously. And here we have another transformation, really. We've talked about the Diableries being religious in content. We've talked about them being satirical and seditious in content. This is becoming funny. This is becoming humorous and entertaining. And it starts to look, for the first time, like hell might actually be fun. <laughs> Um, there's lots of funny little details in this. The, you, we're going to see the band, the infernal band, crop up quite a lot. They're, they're a big feature of, of life in hell for these people. And you can see they must be making an infernal din because the guy at the back is sticking his fingers in his ears and the other guys are looking horrified. The devil, of course, is really happy because he likes to see people suffer. <laughs> the devil wins in every case, as you will see. Here's the colored version. Again, it doesn't look so colored, but you can see it kind of turns a daytime scene into a nighttime scene. And you'll see this more clearly in the illustrations in the book. This one kind of looks like what we call Strictly Come Dancing in England. <laughs> and I think you call it Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> but, yeah, 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 but it's not. It's not. This is a lottery, and the guys at the back are not holding up uh, scores. They're holding up. <laughs> <laughs> they're holding up the numbers, which will give the lottery number, the winning number, which will win you a prize. Now, who is going to win a lottery in hell? Obviously, the devil. The devil has the winning card, and he's looking very smug. And of course, nobody's ever going to win except the devil down there. And you can see his prizes being brought to him already. He has a mere Sean pipe being, br being brought to him at the right hand side. So once again, we see a scene dominated really by humor and entertainment. And, um, and this becomes a theme for quite a while. Yeah, nice in color. So we've seen uh, political cards, we've seen religious cards. Now this is a social satire, of course. This is La Bourse aux Enfers, the stock exchange in hell. Well, everybody knows, <laughs> everybody knows, and well, well you, you've known for quite a while now, especially since 2008, that uh, <laughs> the devil is behind all this, uh, obviously. And uh, so, well, this is the stock exchange in Paris, and Abbe, the sculptor, um, was... Um, uh, well, got into very much detail, and he actually reproduced the, the, the real stock exchange in Paris, which is called the Palais Brogna, which still exists, but is no longer used by the stock exchange. And you can see another invention of the devil mentioned here, crinolines, 
which you call uh, hoop skirts, I think, here. So these uh, fashion, the crazy fashion the ladies had in the, the 1860s of a very, very wide skirts. And they were very expensive and they, they cost a lot of money and they ruined many husbands and families. <laughs> so this is, of course, the work of the devil again. Oh. So here it is in color. And this is another invention of the devil, the tr oh, well, the train, the steam engine, the train. And you can see uh, the, tr the, devil, the devil's train coming out of a tunnel and uh, pulling at the station of, well, Purgatory Station to, um, to, to take to hell all the souls, the poor souls who have not made it up to heaven in Purgatory. So they are standing on the platform. The, the, the engine is called L'Enfer, Hell. Of and it bears number 13. Mm -hmm. Now, the Pope at the time um, used to say, railway, hellway. So it was, it was, you know, common knowledge that railway was the invention of the devil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, when Satan wasn't inventing these horrible things, um, he was also sometimes entertaining, and here we're having a dinner party. What wonderful thing can you do? Um, Enetier, the sculptor of this, also shows us very subtly what an excellent artist he was. Um, the figures in the back are sculpted much smaller, so it gives us the illusion of much, much, much more depth. And the angle of our view is also looking up at it. So in effect, we're below stairs. We're seeing a more exalted position from him. Now, as for the story, let's see if we can figure out what this parody is. If you look at the skeleton in the center who's wearing slacks, he's serving a fish. And to his right is a skeleton who is pouring a liquid into a wine bottle. And the devil is blessing the whole event, not with his right arm, but with his left hand or his sinister hand. And here Henetier has given us a parody of the wedding at Cana. A bear also uh, showed some entertaining scenes. Um, this is a bicycle race in hell. And now, bicycles... <laughs> no musical accompaniment. No musical... <laughs> but they don't look that fat bottomed either. <laughs> but anyway... <laughs> They just don't eat enough. Don't they, they don't need to know. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, bicycles actually at that time were a new invention, and the first bicycle race had actually happened just a couple years before. Uh, so if the French can have a bicycle race, why can't Satan? Yeah. This is the colored version. Now, the bicycles at the time were known as bone shakers. They were, they were made out of wood, and they didn't have any springs or anything, so you could imagine you're riding along and it's shake, shake, shake. But they also didn't have any chains, so that meant that the bigger the wheel was, the faster you went. And so, guess who's got the biggest wheel <laughs> and is going the fastest? <laughs> But I'd also like to point out on this one, these, these figures were about eight inches tall. And look at the wonderful modeling of the muscles and the wings. Uh, these sculptors produced hundreds and hundreds of sculptures, but they took the time to do them properly. They, they really cared about what they were doing. There you go. OK. I thought that was We have was a colored version one. here. Oh, sorry. They look the same. Note to team, we need to speed up a little here okay. because we have 10 minutes left. We like to do some Q&A with you after. Um, this is just one of my favorite views of all time, the visit of the sun to Satan. And um, it's particularly beautiful when viewed illuminated from the back. It's, they vary. You know, they, There's not only coloring. There's not only the pricking of the eyes and the 
and the gels. There's also a, a very clever scratching process that goes on to illuminate like the, the, uh, the sun's headdress. Um, this has a kind of symbolic significance um, because this is just shortly after the Franco-Prussian War of 1873. So this, we think, uh, represents in a sense the visit of hope after the dark years. And we see, just as a matter of interest, a rather more mature Madame Satan here. And we've moved on here from 1860 to 1873. It's still a big craze, but that's a long period of time for a craze to last. Here we go. Now, we are, here we have a, refer a reference, because there are lots of references in Diabaris to um, either dead artists or living ones. And here is the refer reference to a, a band of four, four boys called uh, Les Clodoches. And of course, they are performing here in hell in front of Satan. Now, Les Clodoches were a real band, a bit like the, the Beatles. <laughs> well. And uh, from left to right, you had uh, Clodoche, the leader of the group. You had um, a, f a shrimp fisherwoman. Uh, a fireman and a wet nurse from Normandy because they were the best. Mm -hmm. This is also where we, we have all the milk and butter in France, Normandy. <laughs> so they were definitely the best. So they are performing just like the, the Clodoche, the real Clodoche did perform in front of the emperor and in front of uh, other people, um, Queen Victoria, the King of Belgium, etc. So a, a reference here to living artists. Oh. oh no, no. Oh, there we go. Yes, thank you. Um, in this view by Hebert, this is Satan's gaming room. And what's important about this one, as Denis mentioned, is the artists like to pay homage to different artists. And if you look at the artwork on the wall, he's paying homage to an artist who had just died by the name of Gavarni. And on the upper left, he's shown his uh, lithograph that's called A Sharer of Affections. Um, or women of negotiable affections, if you will. <laughs> and on the upper right, this is his aged ladies of easy virtue. And you can see how he's privately put them in there. Okay. It's finally happened. Hell's frozen over. <laughs> Heber manages in this jolly scene to put all sorts of motion and emotion. Uh, it's hard to get emotion into a skeleton, and if you look at the little guy who's fallen down on the right, he looks really happy about it. <laughs> wow. Wow. Nice. Mm. And if you look at the two in the center, Satan and Mrs. Satan, well, it was known that both the emperor and the empress were good skaters. Okay. These are the firemen of hell, because obviously there's a lot of fire in hell that needs putting out. Um, it's a spoof, again, and this time it's a kind of a, a sound pun, because it's a reference to a song which was very popular in France at the time and actually is still known in France. It's called Les Pompiers de Nanterre, Nanterre being a place in France. So you can tell the sound of Les Pompiers de Nanterre is very similar to Les Pompiers de l'Enfer. Uh, and it's a song which you'll find reproduced faithfully in the book, you'll be glad to know. Um, these are not the kind of firemen you would like to have around uh, if your house is burning, because none of them are doing the job properly, as you can see. <laughs> They're having a laugh, really. And there they are. Here's the young Mrs. the young Miss Satan, Mademoiselle Satan, and she's lecturing here. This is early women's emancipation stuff. God, I can't speak. <laughs> um, she's extolling the virtues of women being allowed to wear eccentric dress. She's wearing men's clothing, as you can see. And you can see these notices up at the back say she's endorsing the emancipation of vice, and she's advocating bigger buns. <laughs> That's bigger hair buns, okay? <laughs> Again, if you look closely, her audience is mainly looking very impressed, I think, with one exception. <laughs> she's also looking for the abolition of crinolines, because that's part of the the, uh, the evil which she is trying to move away from. And um, if you look very closely at her, you can see she's got a champagne glass in her hand and another bottle. She's a good time girl. Okay. <laughs> now, 
And we were very fortunate to find this one and only existing picture of Monsieur Abert with his creation, Mademoiselle Satan. And so now we, we understand what the scale of these models were. She's about a foot tall, and uh, he's got his little sculpting implement in his hand. And unfortunately, it seems that none of these models survive to the present day. It seems they were all either reused or just disappeared. They were very delicate, made of clay. But there she is back in the scene, and now we understand a little bit more about Mademoiselle Satan. This may look a little bit f familiar because the set is very much the same as the set for the skaters. In fact, it's the same set, they've just adapted. So this is a good example of readapting, recycling, uh, not only the sets, but also some of the, the inhabitants of the set. Some of these skeletons we have got to know quite well because they keep cropping up. And there's one particular favorite of Paula's which is called Happy, which you can see where, Paula? Well, he's right up there. You have to find him. You'll, you'll have to look a little close. There he is. Thank you. He crops up in a lot. You'll see in the book he crops up a lot. Again, the, there he is. the nighttime view is particularly nice because all the, the lanterns light up because they've been scratched on the back. And um, there's an enormous number of skeletons in this view. It's getting quite complex, as you can see. And one of them's drowning, or else maybe nobody cares. <laughs> there's the spectators at the top. There's the guy drowning. You, in, in the beginning, you just see his skull, but in the, in the end, you realize he's completely screwed. <laughs> so these are the gates of hell. And as you can see at the top, this is a reference to Dante's Inferno. Uh, it says in French, abandon hope, all you who enter here. And it's also a reference because it's a, the, the hell created by a, um, Aberrant and Etier is a mixture of genres. It's Christian hell. It's, uh, and of, it's also... Um, mythological hell. You can see the, the caretaker is a three-headed dog. Uh, the, the, the guy in the middle who is, who, who is uh, topping, tipping his hat is uh, actually uh, holding a ticket valid for entry. So he's just uh, showing that he, he can go in. And before he, before he goes in, he's allowed to have a last drink on the way in. So we, we, this is what it says. Um, have a, a last drink before you go. Mm. So here is the detail and the, the, the three-headed uh, dog on the uh, right here. Now this is the last, the last card of the A series, um, number 72, Les Cocottes chez Satan. Well, Cocottes were ladies of easy virtue and they are Satan's uh, secret army because they cause the ruin of men, so they lead them to dissipation <laughs> and uh, all sorts of sins. So they, they are very, uh, very much at home uh, in hell and they don't mind at all. They, they are drinking, smoking, chatting with Satan or with his uh, minions and every, every, everything seems fine. Uh, what's, what's interesting here is that uh, all the figures, the female figures, are dressed in uh, doll's clothes. And uh, if, even if you blow up the picture to, to the, its maximum, you can't see any seams. The, we don't know who the, the seamstress was, but she was an amazing, amazing um, seamstress, really. Look at that, for example, here. And they are, they are dressed in the latest fashion. So this concludes the A series. Okay, by now you really know most of what you need to know about the Diableries. Uh, we're going to skip very quickly through the other series, starting with the B series. But the B series happens to be something rather wonderful. Um, the result of something which I guess is a sad event. It seems that the, the Lennon and McCartney partnership, Enetier and Abba, broke up at some point and Enetier went off to set up on his own a kind of rival business although it seems that they still remained friends because there are lots of little nods to each other in their work Enetier became more and more extreme you you probably recognize this because we already saw Pouvoir du Diable the powers of the devil he's taken this idea and this actual sculpture away and he's done his own version of it to start off his own series and his compositions become more and more incredibly lateral and bizarre. We call it B for Baroque. There's more and more figures, and this no longer looks like it's done on a tabletop. It looks like it's suspended in space. It seems like it has no boundaries left or right or up or down or even forwards and backwards. Particularly 
threatening this scene because obviously the the souls are being harvested by the devil and taken off and you might think that this lovely young couple at the bottom left are safe because they must have been good so their souls won't be harvested right but if you look very carefully this is their marriage contract and it's been scratched and in French folklore the scratched marriage contract means unfaithfulness so they will be taken off to hell as well this is another one. This is a fete. This is a festival. And again, a very Baroque composition. It has a lot in it, which you might quickly want to look at. To the left, there's two little pygmy-like figures. And they're under a sign which says, basically, um, come in and see the freak who eats men and eats money. It seems like this woman down below is the woman being referred to. She's the spitting image of Napoleon the third's wife Eugenie and he's the spitting image of Napoleon so this is pretty risky stuff this is getting pretty dangerous the marriage of Satan lots of strangely mixed images here the dove is pulling the uh, the chariot uh, you can see Cupid in there is part of it and uh, in the back you might notice this fountain which is very similar to the fountain of hope which was keeping the poor unfortunate Saint Anthony uh, in solid in his faith way way earlier in the series this is the last one we're going to show you from the B series just we like it I mean as an astronomer I love it <laughs> very very unusual idea because obviously they are not in on Earth, they're outside the Earth, they're on some planet, maybe on International Space Station, I don't know. They're looking back at the Earth and Satan is making sure that there's enough war going on so that he gets enough souls. So that's the end of the B series, a little detail there, there he is looking through his telescope. He's just lovely. Beautiful view. And this will be series C. I will hand over to Paula. Well, Series C is much less sophisticated. You can see the figures are getting all sticky. They're not stick-like. They're not really well crafted, and there's painted backdrops. Uh, the care with which these are being done is not very much. And they're also becoming more topical, more, more newsworthy. This view, and, and we also aren't really sure who the artists were. We know they were associated with Ennetier, but we really don't know the names. Uh, this view is called the talking head of the guillotined man. And what it actually represents is it references a little wax museum that was in Paris in the 1860s, kind of like Madame Tussauds. And you would go into this dark room and there would be what looked like a decapitated head sitting on a tray on a stool. And as soon as you came around the corner, all of a sudden it would open its eyes and start talking at you. And it was obviously an optical illusion created with mirrors, and the visitors easily figured out what it was and started throwing things at it. And so uh, it, it was more famous, I think, probably because it was such a farce. Mm. Now, this is a wonderful current affair. To be honest, it really was an affair. Uh, this is called The Lovers Surprised. And it references an affair in 1867 between Alexander Dumas, the author of The Three Musketeers, and the actress Ada Mencken, who was 30 years younger than him. And she had just married her fourth husband when she and Dumas were photographed in each other's arms. If you look on the left, the man with the wild and crazy hair. Not this one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Your, 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 your other the left, left here. The, the other left was Dumas. <laughs> and, and Ada is in the front. Uh, the press had a field day with this compromising photo, and Dumas sued them and eh, went through the courts, and he was ultimately successful. But it cost him the honor of entering the Academie Francaise. Um, Ada moved on to London, where her name became linked with Charles Dickens and Rossetti. And that's the end of Series D. We're going to move on. Sorry, the end of Series C. And we're going to move on to Series D, which actually gets rather good. It's a shame we can't, more, can't spend more time. But this is Enetier again, and I hand you back to Denis.
Yeah, well, I'll go it quickly. So in, in this in this uh, slide here, Nettier reminisces his childhood. He, he spent his childhood in uh, an, an area of Paris called Les Halles, a uh, big market, and his family lived there. And uh, his uh, his father, his grandfather, his brothers, and even his son later on, they were strong men. They were they would uh, unload all the carts. And uh, he references here one of them. Um, you can see a, a skeleton carrying a bag uh, with the letters HP, Al de Paris, and a number. And all the strong men, they were very limited in number, and they all had a badge with a HP and a number. So he's obviously a reference to one of the, one of the, the people from his family. Now, th this slide here is a reference to the Franco-Prussian War. We mentioned that already. It was terrible for the French. They, 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 Paris was under siege for several months, and uh, the, the battle was quick, and there were cavalry charges, which were very deadly. And in this, uh, in this um, slide here, um, Enetier remembers that, and, and uh, obviously all the French men of the period would um, associate this card with the Franco-Prussian War. Now, if you look at the, this, the detail of the, the, this uh, sculpture, it's amazing, the, the breath coming out of the, the horse's uh, nostrils. So it's a very good Enotier, Enotier at his best here. And this concludes... No, another one for Series D, sorry, but oh, it's Paul. yes. Thank you. Well, we've seen that the um, modelers would pay homage to artists, but in this case, uh, Enetier was, was directly inspired by a specific painting. Now, if you note the figures on the left, uh, particularly the one in the Poirot costume, you'll see that it closely resembles this painting by uh, an artist by the name of Jerome. And he did the painting based on a real duel. So we've got all sorts of references that the, the French would know at the time. But it's beautiful modeling and everything. This is me. Une machine infernale. This is me. Is this me? Oh, this is me. Okay. It's not yellow. No, no. <laughs> We made a book. We've seen, ah, okay, yeah, we're improvising here. We've seen that the, uh, the chemin de fer, the, the train, is an invention of the devil. And here we, we kind of get confirmation of the fact. And of course, we see it exploding. And that's what happens in the nighttime scene. Some of these things are just really beautifully done. And of course, people are getting hurt and wounded and dying. And so here's confirmation that it is the devil's work. Um, we'd like to show you more of Series D, but we're going to move on quickly, otherwise we'll get thrown out. This is Series E, and we're nearly at the end. E stands for Entrée. Yeah. So this is another Entrée de l'Enfer, the Gates of Hell, by a different sculptor. Beside his name on the left, F. George. Unfortunately, George is a very common name in, 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 uh, in French, so it was difficult to find who he was exactly. Now, the E Series has only 12 cards, and... Uh, by two sculptors. We know the name of this one and his uh, figures are easy to recognize, but we don't know anything about the second one except for the fact that he or she loved shiny balls because they are everywhere all over the place. <laughs> now this card is called the Devil in Hell and if you look closely you will notice that the, the artist reused some figures from a previous tableau because the devil, as most husbands know, is a woman. <laughs> Ooh, that was not to That was not to yeah. yeah. He may never get well, out Okay, well, okay, I will correct that. All French husbands know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's we, the end. we are to, uh, yes, that's the end of series A. So now we are in series EH. And EH stands for? No, you're going to tell me what yeah. EH stands okay, for. Okay, so EH are the initials of uh, uh, the, the publisher Eugène Anneau. Here we go. Oh, Things wow. are getting quite basic, but uh, the, the content is interesting, and I would like to call on an expert bell ringer to tell you about this. <laughs> Campanologist, I should say. Campanologist, yes. Um, the only phrase that comes to mind is hell's bells. <laughs> <laughs> they included that for me because I am a bell ringer and I like it, but at the time it was thought that the devil was scared of bells and ringing would keep them away from keep him away from the churches. 
Uh, but the phrase hell's bells has also been suggested that bells were rung when one got to the gates of hell. Uh, you'd ring a bell to let the eternal inhabitants know that they had company coming. Now, Satan doesn't always enjoy himself entertaining people. It looks like he also works. And here he owns his own barbershop. <laughs> Although, if you think about it, it's a devilishly pointless job giving his customers uh, the fact that they had hairless skulls. <laughs> and moving quickly on, this is the final series. We call it F for final, and we're going to scoot very quickly through. Um, they don't seem to have an awful lot to say. Some of them are quite nicely composed and nicely colored, but uh, here you have Swiss Family Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> Here you have the moon from one meter. It does refer to something which was going on in Paris at the time. There was a huge telescope built and it was open to the public and the promise was that they could see the moon as if they were just a mile away from it or a kilometer away from it. And apparently it was, it was disastrously reviewed. They all said it was rubbish and it didn't work or whatever. But you can see something else here. This is a great influence on a man called Melies. And those of you who've seen Hugo, which brilliantly channeled his work into the 21st century, will recognize a definite uh, influence here on the, the moon. This is the blacksmith. Kind of nice to see a skeleton horse kicking his heels. And again, the coloring is quite nice. There's been a lot of restoration done on these, I have to say. There's about six years of restoration work done in Photoshop to, to bring you these images. But I've got to say, this is where we started off in the heyday, in the glory days of the, of the Diableries. And you can see the difference in the, the content, the composition, everything about it is, is just at its peak in the A series. And this is the image we chose for the cover of our book, and it's a lenticular print, which gives you a little bit of a, a hint as to what's inside. This is one of our favorites. It's Depart, Departure for, for War. And um, if you buy the book, you know, or if you'd steal the book, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Borrow. Or, you know, you'll just see what goes on. There it is. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone like to ask anything? They would purchase it. It would be. I mean, it was their window on the world, really. There were no movies. There was no TV. Reproducing is is impossibly um, labor intensive. Yeah, but somehow they managed because labor was cheap, and they would be on sale. Yeah, they would cost quite a lot. I think the average wage was about the price of a car. You know, for a week. Mm -hmm. So they could probably buy one card every week if they wanted to. I'd like to make. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, my New York accent's a bit crap. I do. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, there were people oh, in the room, never, actually. Oh, there were people no, in the room. Okay, oh, this was the rehearsal. Um, I'd like to say, when you were talking about the tissue views, we tried to reproduce them. Mm -hmm. And Very I got to tell you, after a year's work, as he said, it was horrible. We can't do what they did. They're mm. beautiful little works of art. Mm. That's right. Sir? Uh, did you guys just throw those to yourselves? So did you work? Uh, I work normally till about 5 a.m. restoring fanatically and impulsively and compulsively. Uh, in the end, I had to get help. So I, uh, we enlisted a wonderful Photoshop guy, a young guy called Jamie, and he worked on it with me. But between him and me, we did every single image in the book. And that means all the front lit, all the back lit. It means restoring every eye because they've all been by definition, destroyed. Okay. And uh, yeah, it's a big deal, but you have to love it, you know. What's the process like? It's like trying to take, imagine you take a picture and then you put a snowstorm on it. You have to take every single flake of snow off. And you don't really know what's underneath it, so it, it needs a lot of interpretation. But you know, it's one of these things that you can get obsessed with, and the result is so wonderful. You know, when you clear all this snowstorm away, what you see is so transparent and so beautiful, you feel you're right back there in, in the 1860s. So it's very rewarding.
And when you realize there were about 180 of these and two photographs for each one, you can see what a wonderful job he did. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Um, I know from talking to you that there's different kinds of um, stereographs, especially with the light coming through this room. What made you pick the Diabolis as opposed to other stereographs? Well, we love all the stereographs. We just picked it because we had in common this passion for the Diabolis. I mean, when I first saw them, I had no idea what they meant. And I asked people, and nobody else had any idea what they meant. So it was a life's work. I'm talking about 40 years ago, I saw my first Diablery, And it was just great to find these two other human beings who have the same passion as myself. And we thought we have to do this, because we'd all dreamed of creating the book and channeling these wonders into the 21st century. We just love the Diableries. And the thing is, there was nothing written about the Diableries, either at the time or, well, in, in, the, in the 20th century. So uh, mm. we had to, uh, to think about what, what was the meaning, the hidden meaning be, be behind these pictures. Yeah. Mm. More or less chronological, yeah. Mm. From religious to political. Yes. They started religious yeah. because it was well, it was sort of yes, exactly. Mm. And then they realized they, they could ha actually slip in some hidden messages or yes, mm. commands messages. So that's that's how they evolved. The, the quality yeah, the was very sort of deteriorated. Yeah. Yeah, but you're talking a long period, you know, you're talking 1860 yeah. to 1900. Right. Got to say, you know, if it weren't for Denis, nobody would still know about this. I mean, nobody has ever done this work before. Denis did completely original research on this, and he's the only guy who really can tell you any of these stories. So it's been a privilege to work with Denis. And, and I have to say, it wasn't that he just opened an old book. He had to mm -hmm. dig into some really strange little archives to find things. With many cobwebs so dig and spiders. A few and graves, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Paula is the lady who brought us together and made the whole pro project happen and made all the lists. There is nobody makes a better list than yeah. Paula That's Fleming. an archivist. <laughs> Another question, yes? Um, Brian and the group, um, you had mentioned that you were interested in Syracuse as a, as a young person. Um, once you started doing research, how did you all come together? And then what was your first stereo view that you collected, or how did that start? How did it start? Well, differently for each of us. My first uh, 3D experience was out of a packet of cereal in Weetabix. You know, Weetabix packets, they don't do this anymore. It used to be such fun for kids. You'd open your cereal packet and there would be a toy, you know, something fabulous, plastic or a model or whatever. And in this case, in the Weetabix thing, it was a card with two little images on, quite flat and looked kind of boring. And then you would send away one and sixpence for your viewer and a packet top. And then once you put the card in the viewer, the magic happened and suddenly instead of two little flat cards there was a window you could walk through and you could touch you could feel like you could be just in there so I was completely captured and I find that most people who have that experience get captured mm. and the feeling the thrill never leaves them you know so I'm completely as passionate about 3d stuff as I ever was mm -hmm. and we share that um, the Diableries thing how did we get together well it's a long story really but um, I, uh, well, I don't know where we would start, really. We just were lucky enough to find each other. We, and we Elena, all liked it. Yeah, we, it and, worked. Yeah. And it, <laughs> yeah. I yeah we it. shared a passion because we were, we were fascinated by these cards and we wanted to understand what was behind them and uh, we wanted to understand the story and this is what brought us together and this is, this is fun. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh. Uh, maybe young lady. Some of the images. Oh, uh, we do you have to? It's a model. It's it's purely make a model and photograph it. So some of them will have a flat background and some of them won't. Um, just it, it it was a bit quicker to do a painted background than it was to to make models going off, off to infinity like Abed, like Enetier mm -hmm. did with the Last Supper scene. So what you're seeing is really just a stereo photograph of a model sitting on a tabletop, and whatever that model is, that's what you're seeing. So there was no uh, they didn't work on them afterwards. There's no post production. That's what you see. You're seeing a model. What other topics are there? 
What other topics are there? Well, you know, the world of stereoscopy <laughs> is vast. You know, everything that you can see on TV or in films these days, you could see in stereo cars yes. in those days. So you could see portraits, you could see landscapes. They had trips to the pyramids, trips to Histori people growing tea in China. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Historical events. Sure. And historical events, and all kinds of stuff. You know, so it's almost infinite, really, you know, the amount of things. So we could write an enormous number of books. They wouldn't be but quite as... Uh, <laughs> oh, we are. Did we are. We are. Right we are. <laughs> 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 Well, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's very tiring. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but you know, we ha we do have plans to do some more books. Yeah. Yeah. Stereos at the time were their version of TV. So the family would get together and they'd travel to other countries or do whatever. So you pick a topic, there'll be a stereo view of it. Mm. Except space. No, space travel. Yeah, space yeah, space travel. travel. Yes. Yes. Yeah. No internet in those days, you know. <laughs> no mobile phones, but everything else. Yes, it was. Yes, it's it a was. purely yeah. French phenomenon. Completely. Yeah. Fr so that, that's why. That's why the French don't want the book. Actually, <laughs> it's very curious. <laughs> too, too French. Yeah. Still French though. We've had so many offers from publishers around the world, but not from France. It's very <laughs> odd. Strange, isn't it? Yeah. Although after the government shut down, I'm thinking about starting one for the United States. <laughs> <laughs> hey, <all right. laughs> Thanks so much for your attention. Thanks Thank for you being much. here. Thank you all for joining us this evening.